It has been four months since the first case of COVID-19 was detected in Wuhan, China, and reported to the World Health Organization. Since then, what began as a local outbreak has turned into a worldwide pandemic. There's hardly a person on Earth whose life has been unaffected by the spread of the coronavirus. Millions have been infected, almost 200,000 died, billions have had to adjust to a new life of social distancing. Welcome to this Voice of America virtual town hall, coronavirus, global expert answer your questions. And I'm Tatiana Voroshko. While the United States and several countries in Europe have been hardest hit, the virus is growing in Russia, Mexico, Bangladesh and other countries. In many countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America, the lack of testing makes it difficult to measure the spread of the pandemic. Social distancing measures that work in some countries may be difficult or simply impossible to implement in others. And at a time when China and some European countries are returning to some semblance of normalcy, a few African countries have recently identified their first cases. To answer your questions about the pandemic, experts from around the world have joined us for a virtual discussion. Please welcome. From India, Dr. Pritima Chanana, senior anesthesiologist at the Fortis Memorial Research Institute. From Bangladesh, Mejadi Sabrina Flora, director of the Institute of Epidemiology, Disease and Research. From Taiwan, Dr. Chan Cheng Chen, dean of the Taiwan University College of Public Health. And from the United States, Dr. Boris Lushniak, dean of the School of Public Health, University of Maryland. Thank you, panel for joining us. And uh, Kate Lister, President of Global Workplace Analytics. Kate will join us later in the broadcast to discuss workplace practices and the coronavirus. Thank you all for being here. During the show, we will talk about public health measures to contain the spread of COVID-19 and the treatments and challenges of reopening economies. But first, let's go back to the emergence of this pandemic with a question from the global audience. Let's take a listen. Hi, my name is Simeon Pongwan from Mozambique. It has been said that coronavirus has been there for a long time. So I would like to know what caused the outbreak of this virus this time. Dr. Luchniak, you began your career in the Epidemic Intelligence Service. What can you tell us about tracing the origins of the coronavirus? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, the coronaviruses have been part of, of our ecosystem for a long time. Usually we see the coronaviruses actually within the animal population. Uh, right now we've had seven different coronaviruses that have actually caused diseases in humans. Four are very well known to us. So four coronaviruses that in essence cause the common cold. So about 20% of all common colds are caused by the four coronaviruses. There were three recent coronaviruses, all 21st century viruses. One caused the disease SARS, severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome. The other one, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And the third one causing COVID-19. And these three all came from the animal population. What we see is changes within the virus itself. There are mutations and subtypes that develop. Ultimately, a connectivity between the animal world and the human world. It then spreads to a human and then further changes within the virus that potentially cause human to human transmission. And that in essence is what we have seen with COVID-19. Now this brand new virus was first uh, identified early in January as a brand new virus. The cases that we have seen probably go back into December, perhaps even into November in China, but obviously we've seen incredible spread throughout the whole world since then. And uh, just as you mentioned, since the virus emerged, we have learned a lot about how it spreads. But new information is still coming. Let's take another question. We are ordered to stay home to prevent the spread of the virus. We still have to go to the market to buy foods or to a pharmacy to buy medicine. Some of the people who work at these shops and pharmacies are not wearing protective equipment. Then we get back to the house and stay with our families. In this situation, how much are we really protected? Uh, if I can address this question to Dr. Chanana, 
Um, similar question, say I like to run or walk and I'm hesitant about the, going outside. How can we practice social distancing if there is a chance of running or walking through someone else's droplets? Uh, in this scenario, definitely we should maintain a social distancing. That is the best way to stay away from the COVID-19 infection. Other things like in, the, in these scenarios that we cannot maintain social distancing, we should wear masks all the time and we should maintain the proper hygiene. We should wash hands when we come back home after the visit to the market and we should wash our hands with the soap and water that is fair enough uh, to get rid of this virus. And definitely we should wear masks all the time when we are out. Uh, if we may, uh, we just discussed a little bit about mutations with Dr. Chan. If you can tell us a little bit more, because Taiwan was the country which first experienced, um, the, one of the first countries which had to deal with outbreak. Yeah, we, uh, we have very limited cases in Taiwan. So uh, unlike other countries, they can uh, have a lot of samples to, to study. But we did culture uh, as many uh, uh, virus we can have. And so far, we haven't seen a uh, uh, big difference from our cases and uh, many from China in the beginning. But later, so we have uh, more uh, cases coming back from Europe and the US. And uh, we haven't found yet, but we hypothesize that we will find some difference among them. But um, uh, the symptoms are also a little bit different. In the beginning, uh, the people who caught the virus uh, has more cough, fevers, but later on we have more cases of uh, loss of taste. So uh, apparently the virus are, are attacking different uh, parts of the, the bodies. So um, this kind of uh, phenotype that uh, of the symptoms that from uh, infections would be also useful for uh, for us to know about uh, whether the uh, virus has been uh, uh, mutated to, uh, to to some extent. But uh, basically, they are still the same. So we, we think that uh, in the future, if we can have a, a machine, that the machine should be useful for uh, all the populations. And, uh, and probably for all the ages. And uh, we'll see that uh, still under development and uh, hopefully we can have some uh, successful vaccines coming out soon. Yeah. Except the vaccine, it also brings up the issue of immunity and one of the most popular questions. Hi, I'm Arta Mazreku from Pristina. Can COVID-19 be taken for a second time and does it gain immunity? Professor, Flor no, Professor it, Chan and I, it, if I can it, address this question to you, do we have immunity and how long do antibodies to the virus last if, they, if we have them? Any viral infection creates some antibodies in the body. Uh, so whenever this virus attack again, the antibody will fight against it. But as for the WHO saying that sometimes these viruses are not creating enough antibodies mm -hmm. and maybe you can interact with the mutant form of the same virus. So there is a possibility we cannot, it can go to either way. Uh, there is a possibility you can catch this infection again. But in India, we are practicing plasma therapy in few patients. Like we are taking the plasma samples from the treated patients and we are giving it to the uh, sick patients and it is working nicely. But as far as I know that only four or five patients we have treated as of now and they were also with the co-medications so there is a possibility that maybe other medications have acted too. So this is very difficult to say that patient will be immune after the infection or not. Yeah, we're still learning about that. Every day brings some new information about immunity. And every country, every country reacted with a um, similar but unique set of, of, of measures despite its proximity and interconnectivity with China. Taiwan has a relatively low number of infections. What did your country do to control the coronavirus, Dr. Chen? You know, we, uh, in the beginning, uh, st uh, starting from uh, December 31st, we to uh, be alerted of the cases in uh, China. So we made decision we have to act uh, quickly. So uh, speed is uh, very important for us to do. And since the cases are coming from abroad, so the best Paris policy is to do the border control. So we control the visitors, 
and from uh, China. So we buy times and in the meantime, you know, we have a lot of self protection uh, measures. We are in the mask. Uh, Volunteers by uh, citizens is one uh, very important uh, uh, act of our uh, uh, ways of the, the controlling the uh, infections. So it's uh, become a, 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 a nationwide movement. Everybody like to buy more masks. So uh, the, the government uh, are short of uh, masks, that, like uh, any other countries. Then they regionalize, nationalize all the productions and rations of this. You know, so this is very important when um, any country who are in the beginning, I would recommend wearing masks is one way, and hand hygiene also. And then the once you have a first case, then you have to start doing these uh, uh, contact tracings uh, diligently and complete, completely. So we uh, combine uh, our national health data and uh, mobile phone data to do digital tracings. So we find cases, you know, isolate cases and uh, uh, transfer them for further treatment. So this is uh, also very important. Then when the cases are become more and more, you have to do social distancing. And as we learn from uh, a lot of uh, uh, outbreak from other countries, uh, religions, uh, religious activities and, uh, and mass gathering is very risky. So we start having this um, uh, kind of measures of slowing the opening of school, delaying the opening schools, and also ban a uh, big gathering. I think those are very uh, important. We call soft so, uh, social isolations. And you know, we are not doing lock lockdown. We don't want to do lockdown. So if you do this earlier, when cases are very limited, you have to do it. Once yeah, cases is, are too many, I, it's too late. Can I, can I interrupt you? You mentioned face masks. And medical authorities in the United States initially discourage healthy individuals from wearing them. Dr. Lushniak, do you think that was a mistake? Well, you know, it's one of those situations, I think, where we keep learning more and more about this virus, its transmissibility, and what are, in fact, the protective measures that need to be taken. Uh, face masks have not been part of the sort of the culture within the United States as a form of infection control within our population. And I think in retrospect, we would have done this much earlier uh, had we known about the, the sort of transmissibility and the infectiousness of, of this. You know, it, it's interesting because even the theory of face masks is not so much for me to be protected against others. It's for me to protect others. That is, a face mask prevents the transmission from me to you, not necessarily from me getting it from others. Uh, and I think that's a critical feature in terms of the use of face masks in the United States. We've gone from not recommending, and at some point we actually had massive shortages of the certified face masks, the N95 that are usually work, used for healthcare workers, even the surgical masks. Now we've turned in a matter of weeks to a society where people are sewing their own masks, and in fact, government authorities at the state and local level, and even at the federal level, are recommending the use of masks when we're going out to public. So I think this is a sense of the vibrancy of public health, that yes, we make decisions, but once we have further information about the spread of this disease, we in essence have the ability to make those changes within our society. So we are now priming into the world where face masks are, are taken as part of the response to COVID-19. And another measure we practice is social distancing. And social distancing might not be easily applied in countries like Bangladesh or India with dense populations. Professor Flora, how much of a challenge is it for Bangladesh? Uh, it's really challenging. As you say, that Bangladesh is a very densely populated country. So far, we are observing as with, uh, having some incidents of uh, not complying with the social distancing measure in Bangladesh, but most of the people are following that. Uh, we uh, could observe some of the people, those who are going out uh, for shopping or other purpose, but uh, most of the people are following that, but it's really been challenged for us. So as because we are densely populated country, um, and also uh, we can 
Um, in one measurement, we saw that in, in an international scale, it is uh, the stringency is scale says that we are 95 percent um, good in maintaining this social distancing. But at the same time, I would also say that as because Bangladesh is a developing country, it's being a challenge for our economy also to keep uh, close all these factories and all these economic activities. So it's being a challenge, but so far we are following. Uh, I don't know how long we will have to follow it, but um, it's being a challenge. But at the same time, cases of COVID-19 in Bangladesh are not that high compared to its population of 165 million. How do you explain that, Professor Flora? I think we started uh, this social distancing very early. When we were getting a uh, few number of cases, our major started. So that can be one of the reasons uh, which kept our uh, number of cases lower. And uh, also, we don't know about the virus uh, stain, the, what's the characteristics of the virus which kind of virus is available in Bangladesh, what's the characteristics of like genetically how it's working. So we don't know that uh, still we don't have any sequencing data. We are um, in the process of having that. Um, in that case, we'll be able to say which a, how it matches with it matches with the strain of other countries, then we can say. But as a whole, I think it's one of the uh, outcome of our uh, early preventive measures. Uh, we started our activities when we first saw cases in China, in Wuhan. So from that time, we started our activity. And our measure was to um, uh, identify the cases as early as possible and isolate them. And we followed that from the very beginning. As um, you know that its contact tracing is very important. Our first cases were imported from uh, the affected countries. And we did our uh, contact tracing from the very beginning. Uh, we tried to keep them in quarantine, although we followed home quarantine mostly, which is more suitable for us. So uh, I think because of these early measures, uh, we did a lot of screening. Uh, because of those early measures, probably we are getting less number of cases. Uh, there's another popular idea, at least on social media, which explains low number of cases in some countries. Let's take a question from Bangladesh. I'm Hao Begum from Bangladesh. We hear People who took BCG vaccine are less likely to be affected by COVID-19. Bangladesh has BCG vaccine program from long before, but yet people are getting infected and dying from it. I'd like to know, is it only a perception or is there any evidence? So, Professor Flora, do BCG vaccines against tuberculosis work? Actually, so far we know, although there are some literatures, I uh, saying that BCG vaccination might have any role in um, pre preventing uh, COVID-19. But uh, so far, uh, if, if you follow all the uh, advices of WHO, WHO ruled out that. So uh, to me, I don't think it will it gives any kind of protection because uh, it, BCG vaccination is against a bacteria and it's a viral infection. So a uh, lot of things we are uh, saying, but uh, still, we need we have, a lot of things are left to know about this virus. So, um, in my uh, opinion, I don't see any kind of relationship with this BCC vaccination and this prevention of COVID-19. In countries like India and Bangladesh, where much of the population do not have personal savings and can't work from home, can the social isolation measures be the pill which is worse than the disease? Dr. Chanana. Yes. yes, in India, as a um, similar situation as like uh, Bangladesh, we have dense populated areas, so it is very difficult to maintain the social distancing in these areas. But as we are based on the learning from the international movement, Indian government initially announced for the to maintain the social distancing, which is around one meter or two feet away from the other person. And still, people were not understanding the uh, current situation, so they announced they, uh, they had made lots of restrictions for the uh, social gatherings, mass gatherings. And after that, they initiated the lockdown. And once we initiated lockdown, the, definitely the number of patients were very limited. And as compared to the other affected countries, India, uh, the scenario of India on COVID-19 
has decently better because of maintaining the social distancing. But definitely this lockdown we cannot maintain for the long time. It's almost uh, more than five weeks now and uh, we have to open it gradually. Okay. Uh, thank you. Dr. Lushniak, can we at this point compare different approaches around the world and make a conclusion about which strategies work and which don't? I know it's a huge question, but if you can give us some highlights. Well, I think it's a little early to sort of come up with conclusions right now. Don't forget that, the, uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the virus was first discovered or first reported to the WHO office on December 31st, 2019. So we're just you know, four and a half months into dealing with a brand new virus. It is interesting, however, that the epicenter went from, from China to Europe and now to the United States, where the next epicenter is to be determined. But because of that, that sort of approach, if you will, everyone's looking back at past epicenters. So in essence, we are learning from Wuhan in terms of what worked and what didn't. We are looking to Asia of what worked uh, you know, and didn't. We are looking to Europe of what's been working, and now we'll be learning more for the United States. Uh, you know, the reality is that everyone had a slightly different approach on this. We were all trying to do social distancing, perhaps at different times. The other non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as washing the hands, disinfecting, making sure that we kept our hands away from our faces, uh, and staying away from others when, when sick. But don't forget that there's always new information coming out in this short time period. I think a major change for us was the idea that so many people were in fact carrying the virus and were spreading the virus, but were totally asymptomatic. And so I think these various approaches need to be compared. We need to be able to share information internationally under the leadership of the World Health Organization. We need to be able to prime in on what works and what doesn't work, but that still is to be determined. That's true, that's true. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention based in the United States, some of the underlying health issues that make people more vulnerable to COVID-19 are asthma, high blood pressure and diabetes. Dr. Lushniak, how much do we know about the contributing factors? Well, we know that definitely people with chronic medical conditions and, and the ones that you just mentioned are included on that list are at higher risk to have COVID-19, to actually have the more severe cases of COVID-19 and at higher risk for death. Included with that is the aging population worldwide. So once you get to the point of 60 or older, we really see an increase, 60 to 70, an increase beyond uh, what was seen in the general population, 70 to 80 more so, and 80 and above, very much at high risk. So there probably is a tie-in with several things here. One is the immune status of an individual. Oftentimes, chronic diseases do affect the immune system. We know that aging does, in fact, affect the immune system as well. And the use of medications that chronic conditions may mandate for us to take can affect our immunology. So the reality is we know right now what the high-risk situations are, and we need to make sure we protect, in particular, those individuals at high risk. On the other hand, are there factors that help you avoid complications? Here's a question from Ukraine. My name is Yaroslava. I live in Kiev, Ukraine. Is it true that uh, pet owners uh, don't get coronavirus? Or if they do, they have it in a mild form? Thank you. Pet, pets and pet owners being young, being athletic. Dr. Chan, are there underlying factors that can protect people from the coronavirus? Yeah, from the recent uh, data, even uh, young adults are at risk. And uh, according to some uh, uh, cases report from uh, New York, you know. So um, uh, in general, you know, young uh, adult in this time, in this epidemic, uh, there's uh, more resistance to uh, infections. But we still be uh, very careful, uh, even uh, some uh, healthy uh, young adult, uh, uh, they can uh, uh, cut the diseases, and uh, after certain days with no symptoms, and all of a sudden they um, uh, become uh, deteriorated. We also have one or two cases in Taiwan now still in the critical care. So uh, this is a very tricky uh, virus, and we uh, have a lot of unknowns of this one. And even though over the past four months we have learned a lot, but we're still uh, learning. So. Uh, I will say we have to be very alert to uh, 
uh, any possibility and don't uh, be too complacent on that. Uh, being young and you will be uh, fine. And uh, that's uh, sometimes not the case. That's true, that's true. The United States has many cases of young people, even children, who are infected and develop severe complications as a result. But how do we treat them and our patients? Here's a question from Bangladesh. I am Jubala Choudhury from Bangladesh. My question to the finalist is, Malaysia asked for chloroquine drugs from Bangladesh. Does Bangladesh have capability for mass production to chat up the world market after meeting its own demand? Professor Flora, do hospitals in Bangladesh treat patients with hydrochloroquine? And what do you personally think about its use? Uh, Actually, it is a, you can say it's kind of trial product. Although chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, as it's my seen, is being used for other purposes like malaria and bacterial infection. But uh, for COVID-19, it's kind of um, trial product. And so far, we have uh, not high number of cases being treated by these hydroxychloroquine. Most of our patients are uh, in home isolation and they didn't get any kind of treatment in mostly. So they are also getting cured. So, and also WHO have given kind of, uh, you can say, a uh, point of caution that whether we should use that as a routine practice or not. Uh, I would say it's kind of trial product. So we are trying those, but we can, uh, there is no kind of um, randomized clinical trial results which we can refer. And in many, some countries, even it, uh, it shows, um, I think, um, detrimental effect. So personally, uh, and also from my epidemiological point of view, as, as I don't see any kind of uh, good research or uh, well-organized randomized clinical trial is showing a positive result, I would be a little bit careful in uh, suggesting to use hydroxychloroquine or yeah, azithromycin. Overall, uh, thank you. Overall, the development of vaccine or medical treatment against COVID-19 is a popular topic with our audience. Here's another question. Actually, uh, from digital media or social media, we always know uh, that uh, we always notice that there are some rumors or there are some news that uh, the medicines of COVID-19 or like Corona uh, will be made or will be uh, like will be launched in the end of 2020. But I don't know, is it real or not? Researchers are currently testing several existing and in development drugs. Dr. Lushniak, are there any promising trials? Well, you know, what's encouraging, and this is sort of the optimist in me, uh, it says that we've never ever in, in human history have been at this point in time. So first of all, let's put this into perspective. One is we have, yes, a brand new pandemic. We've probably had pandemics throughout world history. Secondly, we have a brand new virus. We've also had brand new viruses. But we've never had this intermeshing of the advancement of science in conjunction with a brand new pandemic. And so I remain optimistic that something is going to be found out there. Now, right now, uh, we're, we're doing a whole lot of clinical trials across the whole world, right? This is important for the globe. And I think at last count, the WHO is posting that over 300 clinical trials are going on right now. And yes, there's a lot of work being done internationally on vaccine development. Thus far, nothing's come through. But the fact that we're putting so many resources and so much effort into this makes me very optimistic. Even yesterday, word has come out from Oxford University of a potential breakthrough on the vaccine front, right? Vaccines that need to be tested over several months, usually over several years for safety and for efficacy. That is, I, are they harmful to humans first? And then secondly, are they working in humans? That's a whole nother story and a whole nother pathway to unfold. It needs to be done very carefully so we don't introduce danger into our society. But this latest information from Oxford University uh, is in fact very encouraging. The hope still is that we will have something, right, in terms of potential therapy, drugs, uh, other things that are out there under development or drugs that are currently being used, being tested, and hopefully a vaccine. The vaccine, we keep saying 12 to 18 months away, but we'll see how research takes us. But I remain optimistic that something will be found. But with all the research, all the resources, and you're still surprised we don't have uh, the medicine to treat COVID-19 because a lot of drugs which have been tested are already existing drugs. 
Dr. Yeah, Lushner. I mean, nothing surprises me here. A brand new virus that we've never dealt with before. Again, this virus comes with its own story and it comes with its own pathway. And the reality is because we've not ever seen anything like this before, we have to have a certain amount of humility in medicine and in public health to say, you know, we don't have all the answers. And you know, we need to be able to research this. And you know, what we said yesterday may no longer be correct because of new data that's coming in. That's, I think, the intermeshing of humility and science working together. Even and when those drugs are approved, it will still take time and money to make them available worldwide. Dr. Chanana, what is the current situation with drugs, treatments and hospital bed availability in India? In India, definitely there is no pharmaceutical product have yet been shown to be safe and effective for the treatment of COVID-19. However, there are a number of medicines has been suggested as potential investigational uh, therapies. Um, many of which are now being um, or well uh, will soon be studied in clinical trial. In India, we are uh, using hydroxychloroquine and in limited manner in uh, control observation and plasma therapy we are using and antiretroviral medicines we are trying. As for WHO, um, cautions against physician or medical practitioner that we cannot recommend these medications without any evidence. But definitely there is a one terminology which is called as emergency use authorization. So we are taking consent from the patient and we are using these medications. As of now, we cannot recommend any of these medications for the treatment of COVID-19 because these medicines are under trial and we do not have enough data to prove it. But definitely people are working on the, these. Even WHO is uh, doing a um, trial on four medications like antiretroviral, uh, hydroxychloroquine, and uh, even interferon beta-1 and remdesivir. These are the medications which are under trial, but as of now, there is nothing proven. So WHO is working on trial. Whenever the trials uh, reach some conclusion, it will be out. But in your medical practice, do you deal with uh, self-medicating and self-medicating going wrong? Do you have this Definitely, it, uh, it, is, it is not at all recommended because there are reports that people have faced some harmful uh, uh, side effects, even the death because of the hydroxychloroquine, because they were taking hydroxychloroquine as well as azithromycin altogether. And both of medications can lead to increase the heart rate, very rapid heart rate, which can lead to ventricular tachycardia and ultimately death. So these self-medications are not at all recommended. But I would like to mention one more thing that patient already taking these medications for other issues like autoimmune disorder, they should like to, they should, they should continue taking their medicines and do not stop taking your medications without consulting your practitioner and even do not take these medications without prescription. Uh, Professor Flora, new cases in Bangladesh are still rising. How are your hospitals holding up? Uh, as because you know, Bangladesh has a lot of resource limited country. So we are uh, scaling up day by day. So we started with design designated different hospitals. Actually, we started with having isolation uh, unit in every hospital. Then gradually we started to have designated hospitals. So when we are getting increasing number of cases, next we are moving to next hospitals. Now, as because we have uh, more or less more six and a half thousand um, uh, cases, now we are developing different makeshift hospitals. Uh, we are trying to manage all those uh, services, but uh, two-thirds of the cases are actually in home isolation. They, those are really very, very smart, mild cases. And we are providing them uh, services through telemedicine, and also uh, our team is uh, calling them, giving counseling, and also kind of mental, um, uh, mental boost up. Uh, so uh, in that way, we are treating. But it's really, it's being a challenge. It's being a challenge all over the world. So Bangladesh also is uh, facing a lot of challenges. But at the same time, so far, we could um, offer services to many of our, um, most of our patients. Uh, but we are not getting 
that much severe cases. Mostly they are mild cases. Even uh, those who are hospitalized, many of them don't need hospitalization. But I think it's been a challenge in both in Bangladesh and India and some other countries like us where stigmatization or discrimination is a little bit there. So in those cases, when they are not allowed to stay at their home, in that cases, even if, even if they're mild cases, we brought, bring them to uh, hospitals for isolation. Um, other than that, as I mentioned, we are scaling up our preparation every day. Uh, we are adding uh, our services. Um, so we hope that we will cope with this situation. But what about, what about ventilators? Uh, does Bangladesh hospitals have enough of those? We don't have enough ventilators. And as you know, that uh, only 2 to 3 percent patients may need ventilator support. But even then, we are uh, in the process of uh, developing that. We are uh, increasing our ICU, uh, ICU beds and also procuring ventilators, increasing our ventilator supports day by day. As I mentioned, that we are scaling up every day our services. So we're still, we hope that we'll be able to cope up. Uh, the lack of ventilators has been an issue in the United States. At the same time, the National Institutes of Health issued guidelines advocating for the cautious use of ventilators. Dr. Chen, what was the Taiwanese experience with the ventilators? Yeah, we have sufficient ventilators and uh, uh, already, um, but our experience is better not to use a ventilator. That's um, if we can uh, 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 treat patients earlier. So in Taiwanese experience, we, every uh, confirmed case uh, has uh, will be put in the hospital right away and uh, monitoring their uh, situations. And uh, so a lot of them, they don't need to go to the ventilations. Uh, we just supply oxygen and some uh, supporting treatments and uh, stay, let them stay uh, in the hospital as long as they can. And some of them will stay around 21 days, you know. So, and for those who are on the ventilators, uh, uh, our success rate is quite good. And we'll even use some ECMO and try to support the patients. And uh, some of the patients actually, they can recover and, uh, you know, uh, totally and, uh, and put, put off these uh, uh, intubations and uh, discharge. So uh, ours, uh, limited experience because our case is not many and uh, it's better not to use the ventilator too early then uh, then uh, probably the, um, uh, the outcome would be better but uh, we don't know whether the, this kind of a uh, model can be applied to uh, places with uh, a lot of cases like new york you know that's uh, uh, that we overwhelm our medical capacity. So far, our ICUs are not are still uh, under control, and uh, so uh, this is the Taiwanese experience. Maybe we can uh, uh, share this with uh, with all of you. Yeah. I'd like to address similar question to Professor Lushniak. Uh, does U.S. medical uh, community came to the similar conclusion, trying to not not to use ventilators if only in the cases then absolutely necessary. Yeah, I think so. I mean, certainly when we were projecting the numbers in, in our epicenter here in the United States, as mentioned in New York City, there was a fear factor that we would run out of ventilators if, in fact, they were overutilized uh, in, in the intensive care unit scenario. Uh, certainly the uh, intensive care units were filled to capacity. Uh, the ventilators were utilized. Uh, however, I, I agree uh, with the idea that, uh, in essence, and, and, and that's the usual sort of methodology in critical care medicine, really putting out a person on ventilatory support is really kind of a severe measure to take. And if there are measures that can be done beforehand, uh, those may be more life-saving than putting persons on, on ventilators. But right now, Although we were fearful of shortages of ventilators in the United States, uh, I think certainly the New York model showed that, that there was a ramping up of number of ventilators uh, and uh, pretty much that we, we did okay. Not great, but we did okay on that. But there is a reflection on where ventilators really play a role in terms of therapy for COVID-19. And uh, even before vaccines were being developed, countries such as Germany, Austria, Norway, and South Korea slowly eased lockdown restrictions. Here's a question from Serbia. Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Vanessa Stroic, and I am from Belgrade, Serbia. My question to you is, um, is there a plan, and what is it 
for the next phase now where people will be slowly returning to their regular lives going to work etc uh, after the quarantine uh, so that the virus is not spread more and um, be for people not to get sick as much as possible uh, Dr. Chen, you mentioned that Taiwan never went to the full lockdown, but still, in your experience, how did this easing was going on? You know, one thing we worry most about is uh, in the future, if there's a lot of uh, lift of the lockdowns and international travel will be uh, become more frequently, then uh, we have to uh, enforce some kind of border control, but this time we cannot ban. So, Probably we will rely on uh, testing, more testings for the visitors. So same as uh, our uh, internal uh, mobilities, and uh, we are thinking of uh, combined um, antibody and uh, uh, and this RT PCR testing together uh, to do this uh, community-based uh, sampling and try to get a sense the real uh, infection rate we have. But our government has not met the mind yet, and but so far because we are soft, uh, uh, soft uh, social distancing, and and so uh, I think the mask should be well until we have a vaccinations. I think this is one, and uh, we try to cut down our mobility by half. That means you know we uh, have to ask uh, probably still half of the population work from home. And the schools, you know, we will uh, use uh, at least half of the, these uh, remote teachings and, uh, and whether we can have on campus, always as we have now, we will uh, uh, look at uh, uh, the epidemic curve uh, globally, regionally and nationally to, to decide it. So uh, I think the mask wearing would be uh, one of the key uh, laws to play in a you no know, in a cloudy society like Taiwan or Bangladesh. We we have to use this uh, uh, daily to, to in public, indoors and outdoor. I think this is the only way we can do it. And if in the future the testing kits can be uh, cheaper enough and uh, widely available that would be uh, used. And once we know this um, uh, uh, prevalence of infected or currently infected uh, uh, populations in our uh, society, probably then we can start uh, losing all the restrictions. So in a new normal society, I would think the, uh, the way we wear, the way we, we, we uh, do the transportation, Will be very different from uh, before, and uh, we are still thinking of that and uh, uh, creating a, a, a situation that uh, that people feel safe to have normal life. Yeah. So it appears that masks are here to stay. In India, lockdown measures were extended from May 3rd, which is just around the corner. Dr. Chanana, do you think India will be ready to open its economy in just a few days? Uh, definitely, India is not uh, ready to open it uh, as of now because the number of patients are increasing day by day. But yes, definitely we cannot maintain it for the long time. So we have to open it in the graded manner. Like we have divided it into, into the three areas, like it's a red area, orange area and the green area. The green area, we mentioned that uh, if we have not reported even a single case over there, so we can open green areas after 3rd May and definitely we have to wait for the orange area and the red area definitely. So once we open up, the world will be definitely different from everyone because uh, we have to maintain the social distancing until we get vaccine in our hand because vaccine is the only cure for this disease and till 60 to 70 percent of population is immunized uh, with this uh, vaccine we are at risk definitely and the vaccine will take 12 to 18 months and we cannot ma uh, maintain the lockdown till then so we have to open it in a graded manner but definitely we have to maintain the social distancing we have to avoid large gatherings and definitely we have to wear the mask in the public areas and as much as people can work from home they should prefer to work at home and uh, we have to maintain personal hygiene. We have to wash hands frequently with the soap and water. 
we should touch surfaces very less and if we are touching we should wash hands and um, i think world will be very different after the uh, lockdown will be removed yeah that's apparent that uh, our lives will be different from what they used to be before for quite a long time uh, dr lushniak what are the dangers of opening up the economy too early well, you know, I think here's a key role of, of surveillance in, in public health. First of all, we have to be confident that we're monitoring things correctly. And, and it goes back to the theory that, you know, the, the, the move really is testing, 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 contact tracing, making sure we find individuals who are positive, treatment. So those T's are very aggressively monitored the number of, of deaths from, from COVID-19. And the second that we see increases, we need to go back to the phase before. Uh, and I think that this whole phased opening approach is the right approach, but you also have to have a vibrant surveillance system so that we don't allow ourselves to progress down the wrong path for too long. Yeah, it appears to be a very long and complicated process, but at one point it will be over. How will the pandemic affect the future? I'd like to pose this question to each of you, and let's start with Dr. Lushniak, if you can begin. Well, let, let's begin with the fact that, you know, first of all, people are suffering worldwide, people are dying worldwide. And we start first with that sense of empathy and sympathy, realizing that this is a world crisis. It's not one nation, it's not one region. And I think we have to reflect on the, the fact is that, that we have been suffering as a globe over these last few months. At the same time, we also have to reflect on the mental health components of this, right? The anxiety, the issue of uncertainty that grows in, and that ties in with the economic crisis that is going on. So to a large extent, let's reflect on those three things and how do we make all that somewhat better. Uh, our progress ahead is going to be a changed world, and the changes really we've talked a little bit about is the whole idea of in the immediate future, we're going to be using this concept of social or perhaps more accurately of physical distancing from each other. We are going to be more wary of our surroundings. We are going to be more wary of us being ill. And so a positive side of this could be that we, in fact, pay more attention to our health, our physical health, our mental health, and our social health. That's the World Health Organization definition of health. It's complete physical, mental, and social well-being. So a positive repercussion of this is that the globe understands the importance of health. It understands the importance of human health and its interplay with animal health and its interplay with global health. And I kind of view us as, as having a potential positive out of this, that we are more aware of the health of our planet, the health of our animal population, and yes, the health of us as people. Yeah, everybody's hoping that something positive will come out of it. And let's take a question from Thailand. Hello, I'm Nisha Han from Bangkok, Thailand, the BOA Thai audience. Um, I have only one question about traveling. As many countries, including Thailand, announced the ban on incoming international flights, which really affect the tourism sector. Um, that's why I'm curious on how long it will be like this and when is safe enough that we can travel abroad again. Uh, Dr. Chen, I'll let you answer this question and tell us how expand on your understanding of the post-pandemic future. Yeah, that's... Uh... The way how we eat, you know, can we eat in out uh, in the in restaurants? Uh, the way we dress, you know, that's a mask could be one part of the, our dressings in the futures. And the way we live and work, the working place, you know, because of this, uh, or this um, uh, working from home will be more frequently. And the way we travel and uh, international travel will be uh, changed, airplanes, you know, and especially the uh, the crews that will be uh, changed a lot, and the way educating and entertaining will also be changed. So uh, I see a a, a a future that during this pandemic and also uh, after the pandemic, it will be years after the pandemic. So, so we are jointly creating a new society that would be uh, somewhat different from what we used to, to be. And so the travel will be not like this kind of group travels and the cheap uh, airplanes, you know, and uh, you can uh, uh, make a decision uh, today and uh, purchase tickets and to go somewhere. I think that's uh, probably cannot be like this anymore. So 
more planned schedules, uh, travel will be uh, the kind of futures and a lot of restrictions, regulations we have to follow uh, that enforced by the countries and who are uh, hosting a lot of visitors. So uh, all of this, and uh, uh, I think it will be good things for us to, to learn from this pandemic to avoid another big uh, impact of future pandemic. So uh, I'm optimistic that uh, we can uh, uh, learn a lot from this and accustom to this and survive this and uh, even prosper in the future. Yeah, that's probably one of the most important uh, important issue. Uh, Dr. Chanana, what kind of change will the pandemic bring to India? Actually, it is too early to assess the damage caused by this uh, global pandemic, but definitely uh, there are some signs that it will promptly change the way society functions. So as of now, I can see that there are um, positive side of this COVID-19 is there is a spread of telecommunication and online learning, that is the positive part. So because of that, some industry will prosper during crisis while the others will suffer a lot. Some workers might lose the job and some may, you know, might get benefit from this telecommunication. So there are the ways uh, we can see there may be a global economical loss. And in India, definitely we are facing a um, loss of economy. It has had far reaching consequences beyond the spread of COVID-19 itself and efforts of quarantine as well. So the pandemic caused the largest uh, global recession in the history, with more than one third of the global population at the time of being placed in lockdown. And there are shortages, uh, there are supply shortages uh, which are not available easily because people are stocking it. And um, I would say the coronavirus recession refers to an economic recession, which may happen across the world and shortage of commodities that are imported or exported, mainly the food products. So people are getting affected, society um, is unprepared, government are unprepared. So the private sector, they are, they are also unprepared. So we are facing a big issue, even the medical support system. Yeah, that's hard to be prepared for something like that. And let's take the final question from Kabul, Afghanistan. This is Rahim Golsarwan from Kabul. My question is, for a much well-organized, generously funded, and a worldwide joint efforts against corona, how necessary it is for all countries and governments to come together and join forces? And Dr. Flora, I'll address this question to you. How, how important it is to join forces? And what kind of future you see for Bangladesh as well? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, it's very important to work together. And as because it's a global concern, so every country should work together to overcome this situation. And it, it's, an, it's, an, it's a global crisis. And also, although we do not have much cases so far, but uh, you cannot say anything, there is a lot of uncertainty with this virus. So we don't know what would be the impact on the economy of Bangladesh, but definitely it would be a big challenge for uh, Bangladesh as for any other, as it is in, in many any other countries. So as a whole, I think uh, to overcome this situation, we need to work together uh, every corner from uh, in, within the country and also other countries. And there are many issues. And uh, nowadays, it's um, it's one world, if we could say in that way. So to overcome this situation, we will have to work together, not only to combat this COVID-19 situation, I think uh, post -pandemic situa during the post-pandemic situation also, we will have to work together as, a one, fo as one force. Otherwise, it's, it will not be easy to overcome the uh, loss, economic loss, and also the life loss so far we have uh, worldwide. Uh, so it's really important. But you still believe that something positive can come out, out of it in terms of international cooperation? Uh, definitely every crisis brings some opportunity also. If we can take that opportunity, to, you know, take this um, opportunity, utilize this opportunity to uh, come together and to work together, that would be definitely useful for all of the countries. And I think that's, that's we discussed all the issues which are extremely important. 
Thank you, panelists, for your time and expertise in this insightful and very important discussion. We hope your countries reach the end of this difficult journey stronger, wiser, and more united. And now to discuss the future of our work lives is Kate Lister, president of Global Workplace Analytics, a research and consulting firm that helps employers understand and prepare for the future of work. Kate, welcome. My first question is, what impact will the pandemic have on workplace practices? It'll have a big impact. We're going to see a lot more people working remotely. We've been doing some surveys around this. A lot more people, about 80% of people are working from home now compared to something less than 10% on a regular basis. And interestingly, they all want to continue to do so. So a lot of people who didn't do it before and now have had the experience want to continue to work at home. Uh, you said 80%, but what percentage do you think would stay? Uh, I, my own prediction is somewhere around 30% of employees will be working from home multiple days a week when this is all over. I mean, I think there's going to be a period where they want to go back to work. They want to be with people that speak in full sentences rather than their, their children. Uh, but I think after that, there will be a, a, a desire to continue working from home. I, as I say, multiple days a week. It's not an either or. It, it tends to be something where uh, that, that half time is kind of the sweet spot. But how the pandemic will change the work we do at the office? This is a trend that really had already begun maybe five, ten years ago, uh, where offices are being completely reconfigured to be the place of collaboration and home the place of concentration. So I don't know if you've experienced it, but a lot of people find they're more productive when they're at home. There are fewer interruptions, and so they're just able to concentrate better. And, and companies have realized this already. Large companies have, have completely changed their office design so that there are places for teams to collaborate and social areas, but not a lot of private space and not a lot of assigned desks. So you come in and, and you work wherever you need to work to be effective. Now, that's going to change a little bit when we go back also. And in which industries do you expect uh, the highest growth of telework? Right now, healthcare, believe it or not, uh, not in terms of the um, practical part of it, but in terms of the administrative part, is one of the leading industries. Of course, IT, as you would expect, right. uh, administrative right. jobs, also call center jobs and customer service jobs. Uh, they've been doing remote work for more than a decade, and I think we'll see a, a, an increase there as well. I know it's a huge question, but if you can answer shortly. Uh, what, would be, what would be the benefits of adopting telework on a larger scale? Uh, people plan it and profit. Uh, so for the people, it gives them back their time. Uh, they would have otherwise spent commuting an average of 11 days a year uh, that they would have otherwise spent in traffic. They get to save money uh, and it reduces stress. From the employer's point of view, increased productivity, better attraction and retention. This is something people want to do. Uh, reduced real estate costs and greater sustainability. And from the planet, again, the, the greater sustainability. We've seen the air cl clear up in a very short period of time. So we know that reducing commuter travel is important. What about our lives outside of work? Will we socialize differently? I think for a time we will. Uh, yeah, I think anybody that has a compromised immune system is going to want to continue to, to work virtually. Uh, in fact, as companies are planning to bring people back, they're not planning to bring all of them back right away. It's going to be a phased approach. And anybody that has, uh, as I say, a, an autoimmune uh, problem will be allowed to continue to work at home. Same thing with the social distancing with our friends. <laughs> Maybe we'll actually see less of our friends because we're so tired of being on Zoom all day long. <laughs> I know, I could, speaking for myself, it's very difficult to get up for an evening Zoom call after I've just spent the whole day on it. Thank you, Kate. Let's hope we will be able to see our co-workers, friends and neighbors in person soon and maybe shake a hand or give a hug. This has been the Voice of America Virtual Town Hall and I'm Tatiana Voroshko. Please stay healthy, safe and informed. Goodbye.